another six patterns video my name is Max I'm Kevin and this is another one in our session of the top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology and we're currently in topic four and topic four gets to the question of what should you do with the blue biopsy right. biopsy with a lot of inflammatory cells so what's our history for today Kevin we have a 51 year old woman who says she's had shortness of breath progressing over the last three months a subacute presentation. Okay, so subacute shortness of breath and no cough. Well, she does have increasing non-productive cough. As of well. course. <laughs> so I knew you were going to ask, but a little cough. Yeah. Okay, so here's our biopsy. Do you think it's a blue biopsy? I would say it's bluer than it is pink. It's it's on the blue side. It's not dense blue, but I can tell even at this magnification that we've got increased numbers of chronic inflammatory cells, lymphocytes, plasma cells. I agree. Certainly more blue than it is pink. Yeah. Now, and it's certainly not normal lung. Correct. I think we can all agree that there's not enough open space here from low power for it to be normal lung. But I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little bit of a sense of a patchy distribution when I look at this biopsy from yeah. low power. Like there's this little area right here where I'm not seeing as much open space as I would expect. Same right. thing right here, an area here, same thing right here. Yep. So what do you always say when you've got a patchy distribution? If it's patchy and nodular, always think about airway associated disease. Which are inhalational diseases. Correct, for the most part. Okay. Sometimes autoimmune, but mainly inhalational. Okay. Okay, so low power, it's a blue biopsy. It's a little bit accentuated in the central lobular regions. I don't know. <laughs> and it's patchy. So if I say I've got a patient who's got a patchy lung disease, right? A lot of people will say, well, patchy equals UIP. So should we be thinking about UIP when we look at this biopsy at 2X? No, I'm not that smart, but I do know that UIP is a pink disease. Yeah. And we're in the blue disease category. Yeah. So, so that's the, your number one tip off. Even though it's patchy, it's not UIP. Right. Too inflammatory for UIP. Too blue. Okay. Okay, so maybe we should go to higher power and check things out a little bit. Wow, let's go to that quote-unquote soft nodule. Yeah, this little nodule. Right. But actually, before we go yeah. there, you know, I always like to look at these low-power images and imagine in my head what the radiology looks like. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because it, it helps me when I look at future CT scans. And so when, it, when I imagine what this might look like, I might think that the radiologist would say there's a little bit of haziness. The lung is not as black as it normally should be. And it's accentuated into these little areas like this, little nodules. But probably not sharp, right? Yeah. Probably fuzzy. 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 So let, let's get into that nodules. 2D, 3D thing for a second, right? Th this slide is 10 microns thick. Let's be generous to the histology. That's very department. generous. 10 microns thick. Now, how many 10 micron sections fit into a millimeter? 100. I was going to say a lot, but 100. 100 10 micron sections in one, one millimeter. millimeter. How about in five millimeters? Now we're getting to the resolution of the CT scan, five millimeters. So, so 500 sections. 500 sections of this superimposed one on the other. For a five millimeter, what, it's gonna, what is it going to look like to the radiologist? It's going to be definite increased attenuation, but it's going to be soft and fuzzy around soft the edges. Soft and fuzzy. And maybe sparing the subpleural regions. Exactly. Just a little bit. Yeah. So we'll get back to the diagnosis at the end, but certainly. Yeah, no, I think it's a perfect thing to do is always, if you can, at very low magnification, imagine what the imaging should have looked like. It will help you, maybe not in the current case, but it'll help you in future cases. So going up here at higher power, we can confirm that we are here in a central lobular region because we right. can see the airway, right. the terminal airway, and surrounding uh, vessels of the bronchovascular bundle. And as we get up higher, we can also appreciate that there is a cellular infiltrate, and that's why this biopsy is giving yep. us the blue appearance from low power. Right. It certainly doesn't hit you over the head. Right. I mean, when I see this, I'm not thinking about lymphoma. Or LIP. I'm not thinking about LIP. <laughs> but you never think about LIP. I, I don't think LIP, LIP exists. Because LIP doesn't exist. Okay. Exactly. Good. So I'm not thinking about lymphoma, not thinking about LIP. This is a, a subtle inflammatory cell infiltrate of the alveoli. Yeah. So it's an alveolitis, you think? Would that be a good term? Uh, 
you might want to use the term alveolitis here. <laughs> okay, okay, and alveolitis. Wow, okay. you don't hear that very much. So we can look around a little bit more. Here's a couple of uh, terminal more bronchioles, airways, yeah. terminal bronchioles. And what if we didn't have a bronchiole? How could we tell if it was airway center? What if the bronchiole had been hosed or damaged and disappeared? Well, Isn't you, there always an artery right next to it? There's always an artery right next to it. So even if the bronchiole is completely fibrotic and destroyed, you can identify the bronchovascular bundle by Where seeing the, the residual artery. Now, yep. what about the pulmonary veins, Kevin? You know, the, the search for the pulmonary vein requires an elastic tissue stain, which is a scary thing to think about because they're so hard to see uh, that uh, certainly at the under 50 micron level, they're, in, they're inconspicuous. You can't see them. They're peripheral in the, in the lobules, so they're not bronchovascular. They're not in the bronchovascular bundle. So you would say that most of the... Those are arteries. Cross sections of vessels we're seeing here are arteries. They're all arteries. Okay, good. So we've got a cellular interstitial infiltrate. Maybe this is an SIP. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable consideration. Uh, I think this disease actually fits under the umbrella of an SIP, an SIP. which non-specific interstitial pneumonia is a pretty big umbrella. Yeah. What, what could be more umbrella-ish than something called non-specific? <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I, I think they refer to it as a specific disease now. It, the non-specific, yeah, yeah, exactly. The specific non-specific interstitial. There, there's pneumonia. a name for that, and in, in the lexicon of the human in, in the English language, when you have something that describes something that isn't, it's some kind of an oxymoron or something. Anyway, something like that. Yeah. Now look what we've come across here: polyp of organizing pneumonia. Yeah. Is it, or is it a fibroblast focus? That is another story. That's for, another quandary for, for another day. For another day. Does it matter? Well, I don't think it matters in this case because we're not really considering UIP. But what does it tell you? It means there's an injury undergoing repair. Active injury undergoing repair. Can you see that in cellular non-specific interstitial pneumonia? Absolutely. You can. In fact, even the original series, there was a component of OP. Yeah. So here we are coming along, and this looks like a, the another bronchovascular bundle, at least the edge of another bronchovascular bundle. And we've run across something here which is probably pretty obvious to most of our viewers here. Right. It's definitely not normal lung. It's not normal lung. And uh, I would say that this is a conjury of multinucleated giant cells. A collection of multinucleated giant cells. You know why they call it conjury, right? I don't. It's because back in the old days when when there were witches in the world, the witches used to get around the cauldron and it was a conjury, a gathering of witches. Of, of witches, yeah. So the giant cells are the witches. Yeah. So, and some of them are not multinucleated. Some of them are just little histiocytes. With that wispy, funky cytoplasm, yeah. So I would describe this as a granuloma, yeah. but it's a poorly formed granuloma. It's, it's loose. Yeah. It, when I look at this, Sarcoid comes nowhere into my mind as fact, a possible differential diagnosis. Yeah. Sarcoid's not in the differential for that. Wait, you just said a granulomatous <laughs> disease in the lung and there's and sarcoid's not on the differential <laughs> That's diagnosis. That's like saying Wegener granulomatosis is not a granuloma. It's not a granuloma. That, we're, that pathology is filled with conundrums. So here's another one here. So now we have three poorly formed interstitial granulomas that go along with this nice cellular inflammatory cell yeah. or cellular interstitial infiltrate. Yeah. And as you said, it's more of a patchy cellular infiltrate than it is a granulomatous process. Yeah. Absolutely. Because we, ha we have to search for those. We, we have ran to into search them. and find the granulomas. And if you look around, there's a few other vague collections of in histiocytes. Yeah. And if this is all we had, maybe we wouldn't go quite so far on this, but this would certainly be raising the possibility of something other than nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Yeah, which especially is if one of those was a multinucleated giant cell. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we've, we've identified poorly formed granulomas. We've identified focal organizing pneumonia. We've identified cellular interstitial infiltrates. We've identified airway remodeling. Uh, well. PBM. Peribronchular metaplasia, yeah. So the airways are remodeled, remodeled, a little bit of peribronchular fibrosis, extending a sheath of the airway. Okay. And accentuation in the central lobular regions from low power. So I think we have all of the findings here to make the diagnosis. Well, let's see. Let's, let's take a look at this patient again and figure out what the heck went on. Um, so her, she did have a CT scan oh, before what, biopsy. What did that show? Ill-defined 
three to five centimeter centrolobular nodules bilaterally in the mid and upper lung zones. That's a very Isn't specific Isn't that exactly what we described, though? We did. I mean, we didn't say upper lung zones because we just have a piece of lung tissue, but right. we described that exactly. Right. And if we saw this picture without seeing the CT scan, my tendency is to put in my comment on the report, I think this is a disease entity, which we're going to name in a second. And if I'm correct, the CT scan should show ill-defined central lobular nodules in the periphery of the lung of the mid and upper lung zones. Lung zones. I would say it in my comments so that when the pulmonologist reads my report, she goes, oh my gosh, how did this person this predict, the, predict the CT scan? The CT, it's because amazing. the pathology does predict the CT. Well, so, as a matter of fact, it is just like two, doing two different special stains on the same piece of tissue, right? I mean, one is pathology H and E, the other one is radiology. The organization of the specimen is a little bit different, but you're looking at the same disease process. And I would even take it further. I'd say the CT scan is the gross anatomy yep. of the lung. Today, we don't do many autopsies. You don't see many Which is okay. gross studies. Well, maybe. Uh, I, we don't want to get into that. But no. the CT scan is your last chance to really see the gross pathology of the lung. It is a pathologist area of interest, not just radiologists. For sure. Okay, so the initial diagnosis was histopathologic changes most consistent with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Hey. So a good pathologist. That's exactly where I would have been with this case. Right. I mean, this looks entirely compatible with subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis evolving so, maybe towards a chronic a little bit more towards chronic doesn't have as much fibrosis as you would expect as full-fledged chronic hp and it's not as cellular maybe it's not as quite as cellular active as... subacute <clears throat> but but if if the pathologist made that diagnosis so astutely how the heck did this end up in your hands out for consultation well this standard this is a standard scenario because the clinician gets the report and says, oh, it looks like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but I did a hypersensitivity panel on the patient. It's negative. The patient has no birds and has no exposures that I can document. So you must be wrong. So maybe you as the pathologist must be wrong. Why don't you send that case out? So that's what happened here. This was a lack of confidence from the pulmonologist. But if the pulmonologist had seen the CT scan, and the, patholo and the pathologist makes this diagnosis, it should have been a done deal. The problem is that the pulmonologists believed that they had to have a laboratory documentation or a clinical documented history of exposure before they could diagnose so-called extrinsic allergic alveolitis hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Right, which actually in over 50% of the cases, you, there is no documented antigen. And that actually is associated with a poor prognosis. Not having an antigen is a bad thing if you have hypersensitivity on imaging and pathology. Exactly. So the pearl with this case is that we bring it all back together. The pearl is that hypersensitivity pneumonitis is not a granulomatous disease. It's it's an inflammatory disease and the, alveolitis. The, and it's an alveolitis. Remember, the original term for hypersensitivity pneumonitis was extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Great term. Right? Too bad we got rid of it. A fantastic term, and it didn't mention granulomas at all, which is actually useful, I think, in, in thinking about this disease, because this is not a granulomatous disease. Yeah. Even it's not. though we always talk about it. And when we say, oh, let's talk about granulomatous lung diseases, HP is always one that comes in, into play there. But it, this is not, per se, a granulomatous disease process. And Max, what do you say when somebody calls you on the phone and say, says to you, I have this fantastic case of HP. You should see the beautiful granulomas. They're everywhere. And you I say, say, it's probably not HP. If you see granulomas from low power all over the place, you're probably dealing with a different disease process. So Infection. Sarcoid. Nodular sarcoid. I mean, there's a bunch of things that make well-formed granulomas. But this kind of a granuloma is, is very helpful and characteristic by the paucity of granuloma. Fantastic. Okay. So, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, not a granulomas disease. It's an alveolitis. It's included in the blue biopsy differential. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed this case.
Thanks, Max. Don't forget to like and comment below, and uh, we'll see you next time.